Hello, and welcome back to Technology Now, a weekly show from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where we take what's happening in the world and explore how it's changing the way organizations are using technology. We are hosts, Alicia Kempson Taylor, in again for Aubrey Lovell. And Michael Bird. And just like last week, we are recording this in person from the Customer Innovation Center in London. Yes, we are. And uh, it's so lovely to be sat opposite, physically in the same room, opposite each other. So maybe we'll do more of that. Anyway, in this episode, we are looking at a topic which we could spend a whole lot longer than one episode on. So we're going to make it a two-parter. Uh, <laughs> cybersecurity and mental health. Now, we're going to be looking at two aspects in particular. Why our health data is particularly vulnerable and of interest to criminals and how our mental health state affects our ability to be able to make good cybersecurity decisions. Now, in this episode, we'll be examining the first part of the equation. Why our mental health interactions are vulnerable? Why are they of interest? and why all of our organizations should be paying attention to the issue. Next week, we'll be looking at how to put people in the right mental headspace to make good decisions around their security or to put safeguards in place. Yes, super important topics. So if you are the kind of person who needs to know why what's going on in the world matters to your organization, this podcast is for you. Oh, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out. Right, let's get into it. Our health data is a huge industry in and of itself. According to Statista Market Research, global revenue in the digital health market is projected to reach 171.90 billion in 2024, with average revenue per user of around $85. That is a huge amount, but not without its challenges. Personal health data is now the most valuable form of data on the dark web, even more so than credit card data. Hmm. That's according to research from Professor Kevin Curran at the University of Ulster, which we've linked to in the show notes. Meanwhile, in January 2021 alone, a total of 878.17 million data records were compromised worldwide. My goodness. And that number is likely to have grown significantly since. That's according to research published in JAMA Health Forum, which we've also linked to. We've got those statistics from a paper called Cybersecurity, a critical priority for digital mental health, published in the journal Frontiers in Digital Health. It's obviously a massive issue. So today we're joined by one of the authors of that paper. Catherine Nibbs, a psychotherapist and specialist in online harms. Catherine, welcome to the show. So why is mental health data particularly valuable to cyber criminals? Certainly, the way I approach this is from an ethical and cyber ethical perspective, that actually the mental health services hold what I call sacrosanct data. And the reason I say that is the level of cybersecurity required for banking protects your financial data. And that might include your address and transactions that are coming in and out. However, when you talk to a mental health practitioner, the perspective that you take is you share your secrets, your wishes, your desires, third party information, you share your traumas, you might share your political views. And we move into a space where I think under GDPR, that gets called sensitive data, but I'm saying it's more than sensitive, it's sacrosanct. If that data is specifically targeted, it can be sold to um, cyber criminals who might then sell it on for ad revenue. It can be used to threaten somebody with, you know, if this information is not known outside of your relationship with your health practitioner then that puts a whole heap of pressure on people. And and one of the particular approaches that I often say in this space is that data that you share with a healthcare professional, whilst it's sacrosanct, it also has the most leverage for blackmail, for coercion, but also it has the highest threat in terms of what a person might do should that data be revealed, if that data is misused for nefarious purposes in any way. So how is it that our mental health data becomes so easily mined and so easily made available? Where do those weak points begin? So in my experience, and I've been doing this for a long time, 
I would say mental health professionals or healthcare professionals usually move into this role because they want to help people. And that means that the kinds of personalities that move into this space are not necessarily, like myself, a, a systems thinker. So being a systems thinker myself, I tend to look at um, high-end integrity, ethical values, and what it is that I'm actually doing when it comes to the use of technology. So I have a particular approach in terms of protecting data, knowing how to protect that data. And that comes from a background of being around engineering, uh, being in the military, and certainly knowing about things like personal security, information security, and cyber security. Whereas many of the professionals who move into a space of wanting to help are not necessarily versed in the intricacies of technology. They're not necessarily versed in data protection, the legislation, because that's almost an outside part of the training. What we actually train to do as healthcare professionals is how to talk to their clients and patients. And the use of technology in practice is not necessarily a core part of the training of many disciplines, hence why myself and some of the other contributors to the article took the approach we did, because we we see that there is a huge crisis that hasn't really been addressed in relation to data breaches or data concerns being used for um, those ad revenue or nefarious purposes just yet. Could you talk us through how someone might inadvertently put themselves at risk? So I will receive contact via a number of uh, locations online. And usually what happens is people in distress are not in a position to think about, if I email Kath and I give her all of this personal information, what, what's referred to as sensitive information under data protection, what's going to happen to that data? How is she going to look after it? Where will she store it? How long will she store it for? Non, none of those questions are really in a person's mind when they're in a state of distress. And what's currently happening is I often use the term to vomit in terms of this is what people in distress do. They will say to you something along the lines of, hi, Kath, I've split up with my partner, my nephew, my niece, my friend, whoever it might be. They're suffering with depression. They're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing the other. He said this, she said that. And they put it all into one contact with you because they want you to understand where they're coming from, they want you to see their distress, and they want you to help them. So certainly on a lot of the social media platforms at the moment, this is happening in DMs. So I've had to put a caveat onto my uh, social media platform saying, I cannot help you in the, the direct messages, and please don't send personal information through. And unfortunately, people in distress don't read that. They are not in a place to consider it. And so they share they overshare. And unfortunately, most email service providers that practitioners use, they're not encrypted, they're not protected. For example, contact forms on websites are not necessarily secure. They're going through a third party. And even that level of consideration seems outside of the practice of many practitioners because what they do tell me is, well, I'm using X service or I'm using X platform or I password protect my computer. And I say, okay, have you considered that even if you're contacting your your potential clients, customers, patients, and you're using your mobile phone and you're connected to a Wi-Fi network in a cafe, you're really not protecting that person's data. It really does require us as these professionals in the space of using technology that we actually have a basic understanding of cybersecurity. Ah, so... What can people listening who are making an outreach do to protect themselves? I do say to people, please don't reach out with personal information. Please reach out and say, for example, one of the platforms I used to use would say, please email me and say confidential or please email me and say, email me, Kath. And then what I would do is provide a secure link for that person to reply back to. Sadly, the service I was using at the time is no longer running. So... At the moment, what I suggest to people is that they reach out and they say, hi, I'm looking to book an appointment or hi. And even in the space of where we are, I think sometimes the website URL or somebody's email kind of gives away what service you're delivering. 
But by the very fact that people visit our websites, by the very fact that they email us, it might not protect every part of their data. Generally, I would say try and find the most secure method of contacting somebody, which in today's age might just be text messaging. It might be to call the practitioner. And if you're going to send an email, keep the information that you share to a minimum. And in your opinion, do you think that there is a need for regulation in this space when it comes to health communication? In one word, yes. The reason is, is because and I'm just thinking about how the internet gets talked about. So it's the wild, wild west. Well, in that case, we need some form of legislation and the rules and regulations are what help us form social norms. And those social norms are there to protect the people who are part of that tribe, that society, that village, so to speak, that I talked of earlier. Thanks, Catherine. There are some really amazing insights in there. Now it's time for Today I Learned, the part of the show where we take a look at something that's happening in the world that we think you should know about. Michael, what have you got for us this week? Well, this week I have news that scientists believe they may have discovered the exact spot where humans became the creatures we are today, mostly homo sapien, but with a touch of Neanderthal genetics, somewhere between 1% and 4% for most of us. Now, researchers from Cologne in Germany believe they may have pinpointed the spot where humans and Neanderthals first met and learnt to coexist, at least for a while. Using a novel combination of a genetic archaeological, topographical, and ecological data, the team managed to narrow down the location to the northern part of the Zagros Mountains in northern Iran. The region has plenty of natural shelter, good resources, and the perfect climate combination. It's warm and dry in parts, which is what modern humans like. And on the other hand, it's colder, even snowy in other pockets, perfect for Neanderthals. The research suggests that the mountains acted as a funnel for the two groups as they migrated north and south, meaning that they were forced to interact in the mountain passes, something that's supported by archaeological and DNA evidence. The evidence of both has previously been spotted in the area, but until now, the point where our genetics became what they are today has been shrouded in mystery. What's not yet known is exactly when it happened. The window is is quite large because it sits somewhere between 80,000 to 120,000 years ago. Wow, awesome. Thank you for that, Michael. Right, now it's time to return to our guest, Catherine Nibbs, to talk about our digital mental health data. So Catherine, are there major differences between the ways that individual practitioners are approaching this versus large healthcare organisations? So if we look at individual practitioners, small and medium enterprises, all the way through to large organisations, corporations, NGOs, uh, there is a stark difference. And generally, that's because if we think about large organisations, they can afford to employ staff who are trained in and around IT parts of that business, for example. So often... When I'm working in this country and I'm talking to singular practitioners, they're using consumer-based video platforms to provide confidential services. And when I have a conversation with them, what often happens is they will say, well, this is what, so if I just mention the NHS, which is the, the largest healthcare service that we've got in the United Kingdom, they will say, but that's what they use And then I have to have a conversation with the the practitioners and with the services saying, okay, but in this particular organisation, they have IT staff, they have systems analysts, they provide weekly backups. If the organisation has that infrastructure in place, then the employees and people who work there are held and contained within that infrastructure. And singular practitioners have to be all aspects of a business whilst operating and using technology. Okay, but I suppose it's not foolproof, right? There have been huge leaks of healthcare data from large organisations. Yeah, we're all fallible because we're humans. And I think when we talk about um, data and working in this environment, we often forget that data is many different forms. And I think that's also confusing to some of the the practitioners when I explain to them about the use of mobile devices, the use of paperwork, and how we transition between those different mediums and spaces. And also, 
what we're actually doing when we think about maybe the device we're using and how we back that up ourselves and the fact we're then using third-party services to do so and what that actually means. So it's a really complicated landscape at the moment. Mm. And do you think among SMEs, the understanding of this issue is improving? I would say in the last five years, I am finding the same issues, the same levels of, I didn't know that. I didn't know that people could do that. I didn't know that that would happen. Nobody told me. There's a large level of naivete and there's a large lack of, it's too complicated, I don't want to know. And, you know, if there was recommended software, and often I get asked this question about, so what do you use, Kath, or why are you recommending that platform? And I say, because... At this point in time, it's a trustworthy service or it's a trustworthy platform. I have yet to find a safe and secure platform for healthcare services, one that has really high levels of industry standards. And there have been a few attempts. And sadly, the bit that I find that's really, it's really hard to swallow at times here is practitioners also don't want to pay out for platforms when there are free services that people can use and that makes their life easy and to give you an example of that even one membership body said to me oh don't make it complicated we can just use a named a uh, consumer-based video platform because we all know how to use that one was was the next sentence so Catherine why should our organizations be concerned about our health data particularly around mental health and I guess then what happens to it This is everybody's responsibility. If we provide a service that's within or under that umbrella of healthcare, we have to consider that the people using that system are not end users, as we often refer to them. They are people with their own histories, with their own distress and tolerance levels. And when we are using, processing, protecting data... That data isn't just ones and zeros. It's somebody's history. It's somebody's sacrosanct data. We certainly need education around technology. And what's really happened is technology became something that's now so ubiquitous that we haven't even stopped to consider the ramifications of it. And many of us have begun using this technology without ever taking a step back, taking a moment and saying, what is it that I'm doing? What is it that I need to think about? What are the risks? What are the dangers? What are the pitfalls? And what are the things I need to do? And yes, we certainly need more education, legislation that helps us understand this, and most certainly training. And that's one of the points that's in the cybersecurity article is the recommendation is all healthcare professionals have training in data protection from the outset of their training. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been really great to talk to you. And you can find more on the topics discussed in today's episodes in the show notes. Right, we are getting towards the end of the show, which means it is time for This Week in History, a look at the monumental events in the world of business and technology which have changed our lives. Michael, what was it from last week? Well, the clue last week was it's 1869 and this Austrian invention was a real red letter day. Alicia, what did you think it was? Do you know what it was? Um, I have an idea, but I I don't know if I'm quite correct on this one. Okay, well, I'll tell you what it is and you can tell me if you got it right. Because, hold on to your stamps, it's the invention of the postcard. Ah. No? No, no. Oh, oh, no. No, okay. <laughs> uh, which was this week, 155 years ago. One Dr. Emmanuel Herman had suggested so called correspondence carts, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, <laughs> uh, to provide soldiers with a cheap way to keep in touch with home. They were an immediate hit. Three million were sold in the first three months, and within a few months, the rest of the world picked up on them too. Here in Britain, 75 million were posted in the first year of use with the US following in 1873. Amazing. That is pretty cool. Very impressive. And the clue for next week? Well, it is 1942. Just copy me and you'll be fine. Any ideas? Uh, No. So, you know what? The last few I've really struggled with. So, no. No idea. Well, that brings us to the end of Technology Now for this week. Thank you to our guest, Catherine Nibbs. 
psychotherapist and specialist in online harms. And to you, thank you so much for joining us. This episode of Technology Now was hosted by Alicia Kempson-Taylor and myself, Michael Bird. And this episode was produced by Sam Datapoulin with production support from Harry Morton, Zoe Anderson, Aubrey Lovell, Alison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri and Camilla Patel. And our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandro Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Amber Maldonado. Technology Now is a Low Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and we'll see you at the same time, the same place next week. Cheers. Cheers.